And yet, and yet, they're all there. They understand. They, they get it. And yet they're still saying, we believe that, that psychedelic medicines hold the promise of, of something we've never seen in, in mental health care. And we're willing to go through this uncertain time if we have to. They're the pioneers, really. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Daily Mushroom Podcast. Today on the podcast, we have Dave Phillips. Dave is a registered clinical counselor who has integrated psychedelic therapies into his practice in the past five or six years. Uh, Dave has the Section 56 exemption from Health Canada for psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy, and he also has a license for ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. He is currently training up cohorts of uh, nurses and counselors across Canada, and by the end of 2021, he'll have about 80 people trained up and ready to go. Uh, unfortunately, these people can't practice um, legally until they get their own Section 56 exemption. So um, tune in and listen to why the work that Dave is doing is so important and learn about how you can help uh, push this movement across uh, so all of these therapists can do what they do in safe spaces with their clients uh, and bring their work um, out from behind the shadows. Dave is a brilliant storyteller, hilarious guy, and I uh, really hope you guys enjoyed this conversation with none other than the legend himself, Dave Phillips. So um, what I know about Dave Phillips is that you are a, a psychotherapist, clinical counselor. Yep. Yeah. RCC. And, yeah. yeah. RCC. And what is it says for the clinical. registry of uh, clinical counselors, and so that's the national registry. And then British Columbia's got every province has got their own regulatory board. So ours is British Columbia Association of Clinical Counselors, and so I've been I've been with them for I don't know 15 years. Before that, I was with American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. So that's where that where I've held my search through the years. Are you from the United States originally? No, no. I mean that's just the organization. I, ah, I, did, I, I did I did one of my graduate degrees in Seattle. So okay. kind of kind of consider Seattle my home away from home. And yeah, yeah. But I'm a Canadian, true blue, all the way. Yeah, right on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Love it. So uh, uh, so what um, I want to I want to just jump into Dave Phillips before the yeah, psychedelic that, yeah, journey. That, that, yeah, that could be an interesting conversation. Let's sure. let's talk about that. So we're, we're how just, far back do you want to go? <laughs> uh, let's go back. Maybe Maybe when like that first hint of curiosity came along, yeah, well, that, that I mean, you might want to try, you know, ex like experimenting uh, outside of the traditional norm of, of psychotherapy. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, let, let me just kind of embed who I am professionally. So I, uh, I started uh, as a therapist. I was a, I was a, kind of a church counselor. I had a graduate degree and a master of divinity in counseling. Back this back in the '80s, and I worked at a church doing kind of counseling for the church and whatnot. But uh, uh, I, my trauma caught up with me. In mm -hmm. at that point, I had some pretty serious mental health issues, so I had to like leave that context. It wasn't a good fit. I wasn't a good fit for kind of the Christian church, anyways. But uh, I went back to school and got another graduate degree. Uh, this is the one that I was talking about in Seattle and uh, started to practice here in Canada. And so I'm practicing in the early 90s. And this is just when the big cultural denial around sexual abuse has been removed. And we have all these people coming into our into our uh, offices dealing with sexual abuse and trauma. Yeah. And I had no idea how to treat them so that mm -hmm. I became even though I was certified as a marriage and family therapist, I became a trauma therapist very, very quickly just out of, you know, just out of need. So I'd been a trauma mm -hmm. therapist for like, uh, you know, yeah, ever since then. And trauma therapy is really hard. And, yeah. uh, you know, you're sitting with people who are dealing with some really massive personal issues, relational issues, work issues, whatever, mood. And, you know, they didn't do anything wrong. You no, know, they didn't ask to be, you know, abused or anything like that. Yet they're having right. to deal with this. So I feel my heart is for them. And yet, as a field, as a therapeutic field, you know, our, our batting average was just not great. Mm -hmm. with, uh, with, with PTSD and with trauma in general. And, and I care deeply for my clients and was, have all, because I've always tried to be on the cutting edge, what, what's going on. I was one of the first therapists in Canada to be trained in EMDR, which is a, a therapeutic technique. I, I got trained as internal family systems back in the late nineties, mm -hmm. uh, brought neurofeedback into my work in, uh, the early two thousands. So I've, like I say, I've tried to be on, on the cutting edge and yet, I hope you can appreciate, Brett, what it's like to be sitting across from someone that you care deeply about mm -hmm. and recognizing you just can't get through their defense systems. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. how caring and loving I am. They've, they've, they've put these defense 
uh, structures in the place for decades and they're very, very good <laughs> and yeah. they kind of keep people away. And so that you could, you know, uh, sometimes be sitting, being with people on and off for 10 years and very little, you know, and that's just the way it is. I mean, it, like it's, it's obviously some people get better and it keeps you going. Right. But anyways, there's this big thing. So in about 2015, uh, I read an article that uh, talked about uh, MDMA uh, being used to treat PTSD and and I was like, yeah, whatever. Because I, I, I just, just two years earlier, <clears throat> I'd been at a major national conference on substance abuse right. disorders. And I remember a speaker saying, ecstasy is the most dangerous of all the street drugs. And she had, you know, she had lots of data. And I just remember like writing that down because I'm, I'm not a street drug user, right? I don't know that world. So yeah, ecstasy bad, right? That's just one of my brain. Why and was she saying, what were the, the risks that she was Well, so this again, of? this would have been around 2013. And especially okay. here in BC, we had had some deaths, some ecstasy, like kids stacking, you know, taking right. four or five pills a night, overheating, you mm -hmm. know, and just the, and dying through, you know, through that. And, but to be real, honest with you i didn't know she's she's the expert she's right. telling me it's one of the bad ones i've never done ecstasy so i know nothing about it mm -hmm. and uh and even when i read mdma i was like what's mdma oh it's actually okay so so i, I honestly i just dismissed it i said okay right. that, that's silly and then uh about and a big difference between street ecstasy and then like pharmaceutical grade MDMA. Oh, 100 percent yeah, yeah and yeah. we can talk about that but, but at the oh, time no, for sure, at the yeah. time i didn't know that Okay. Yeah, the, I mean, course, it's just it's chemical stuff, and and you know, yeah. and also that's just not a, uh, you know, I we by the mid by 2015, the therapy field was becoming very and is very militant against like the medical perspective of treating mental illness. Mm -hmm. Like antidepressants by that time had been exposed; they're mm -hmm. not working. They're actually hurting people. You talk to any doc; they know that. And so now they're saying, "Ah, medicine." And it's just like I'm prejudiced against it a little bit. Uh, so yeah. it's about it was about a month later. It's like quick, quick uh, uh, turnaround. I read another article that was uh, about. Um, Johns Hopkins University's trials using psilocybin. Yeah. And that got my attention because of Johns Hopkins. Yeah. Right. I have a lot of respect for them. One of the leading medical institutions in the world. And, but again, my response was like, mushrooms? Isn't that like LSD? <laughs> like, I was like, what? Right. So just a little story. In, when I was in grade 11, I was working for a summer job. And I was huh? working for, uh, I was in Kamloops at the time, working for a local newspaper, just recruiting paper boys. And it was me and another grade 11 kid from another high school. We would we would do this. And he came into into the office on the Monday, and he he looked bad. He was he was <laughs> white as a ghost. Yeah. I said, "What the fuck happened to you?" And he <laughs> said, "We dropped we dropped blotter on the weekend." Which is LSD he says we dropped blotter on the weekend, and me and three other guys. And Dave says, "Dave, for eight hours, I was trapped in a room with insects that were trying to kill me." Oh, and no. I could see that he was absolutely traumatized. I was like, just made a note to myself. Okay, don't if do acid, that. if acid could do that, yeah, don't yeah. do that. Never do acid. Like I don't care how good it could get. Right, if right. it could get that bad, I don't want to do with it. So that's in my brain, and honestly, just never, never really thought much about it in the intervening, you know, fifty years mm -hmm. or whatever, forty years. So, but I read that about Johns Hopkins, and that got my attention. And so I just started. Okay, I need, I need to read more about this. And the the more I got into it the more my eyes began to open. And I said, mm -hmm. I thought to myself, even though at that time it was pretty illegal in Canada, I thought I need to, I need to understand this because this could help my patients. Yeah. Yeah. And so just for, just for our listeners there, tell us about some of the big points in that study that really stood out to you, the 2016 study. Yeah. The, study. And again, that was like a, just kind of a beachhead. That's where I started in. But as I started to really get into the Johns Hopkins stuff, uh, the thing that, that, just got my attention more than anything else was the outcome numbers. Mm -hmm. Like, you understand that, like, they're, they were looking at end-of-life anxiety, mm -hmm. okay, which, which is a pretty resilient uh, therapeutic condition, but mm -hmm. also at the time I was getting into the Imperial College. Imperial College is in London, and again, one of the leading institutions in the world, and they were studying depression, and they were studying specifically treatment-resistant depression. So, yeah, I understand. Like, this is, like, by definition – our outcomes are very, very low. This is treatment resistant. And to qualify for the imperial studies, you had to be, the, the first ones, you had to be in, in, in uh, you had to have the diagnosis for at least 10 years. You had to be in three different modalities of therapy, right, to, to qualify. And so for these people, they were getting 70 to 80% uh, uh, recovery from depression 
Uh, mm -hmm. After a single dose session, three, you know, a couple therapy sessions of integration, and it was sticking after a year, 60% after a year. And again, in my world, we never saw numbers like this. And then right. a kind of a parallel track with the MAPS MDMA trials. Okay, now that's, I got a lot to say about MDMA and, and psychedelics, but the differences. But in that lane, right, MDMA was working with, uh, they, MAPS was doing the trials and they eventually did, you know, did phase three trials. Mm -hmm. and, and they were getting 80% recovery. And as a trauma therapist, I, honestly, I was like, what the fuck? I've, yeah. like, I've got to understand this. Because it probably didn't even seem real. Like those it, well, on one level, it didn't, except the credibility of right, you know the these are FDA approved uh, trials, yeah. right? Health Canada approved trials. We had one in Vancouver. It's like these. This is credible science. This is yeah. credible stuff, and yet it's incredible what's coming at me, and enough that I I, I recognized you know hey I got to learn about this. I need to understand mm -hmm. this. I can't I can't be kind of a spectator on on the sidelines with this one. Right, and you probably had the Rolodex of patients that came to mind where you were like, I, I need well, to at that time, it. you know, early on again, I just like, I can read these articles, but until you actually get into like using the medicines, being mm -hmm. with the medicines that, that that's when things really change. And you, mm -hmm. you know, you start to recognize, okay, we are dealing not just with a, a new thing in terms of outcomes. It's experientially, even like from on a paradigm level, this is very different psychotherapy. These are, mm -hmm. these are not neutral medicines. This is a, these are very active things and I needed to learn it. Right. And so at first I, I was just more academically curious, right. right. And just uh, to trying to understand it. But then as my own kind of uh, development as a therapist, but also my own uh, development as a human being, I guess, or whatever, I have my own personal experience with these things. That's, that's when I began to say, okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with some friendlies, right? So it's just non-clinical people. That's where I started mm -hmm. my work and then, you know, gradually moved into the clinical domain. Yeah. So, uh, so kind of like 2016, curiosity got piqued by the John Hopkins yeah, study. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then, um, intellectually trying to understand psychedelics from the right. outside looking right. in, right. Can be a very challenging thing. You yeah. can read all the data you want, yeah, you can see yeah. it, but so that the next step is going through the experience. Well, as it became, so, I mean, do, do I, I don't mind telling the story, like kind of how it happened, if you don't mind, or I would, it's up, yeah, it's up of, to you of how you got into doing yeah 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 tell, take us through yeah. that yeah so yeah, i, I did, again there's 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 no like uh roadmap mm -hmm. and especially there wasn't a roadmap for me as i've come to understand there were ways i could have done this better but you know you don't know what you don't know and uh so i tried to get uh get trained that was my first thing okay i need to get trained and so really there were only true at least at that point i was only aware of two possible training kind of ways. One was to get, uh, become a therapist with maps here in, in Vancouver. Right. And so I applied for that and, uh, you know, they told me very sweetly, thanks for your interest, <laughs> but we've got, you know, a thousand therapists who are interested yeah, we're yeah. underfunded and we don't even have patients right now. And so right. that was a dead end. And so the other is, uh, CIIS in San Francisco. So the California Institute for Integral Studies, this is, um, Stan Groff's thing. And, uh, you know, really, I could tell early, very, very well respected. Had been around for a long time. It was expensive. It was like ten grand for a year. But I applied, and again, I got waitlisted on that mm -hmm. one. And mm -hmm. and you know, I felt really frustrated. I was like, hey, like, guys, I'm trying to do this, but I, I didn't know. So then, uh, so then the next option was uh, psychology. Psychedelics Today is a podcast. I don't know if you know Kyle and, and Joe. Kyle uh, yeah. uh, Joe Moore, they do this, uh, you know, I, I think fairly well subscribed podcast uh, called Psychedelics Today. And it was just kind of in its early days then. And uh, they um, uh, they were off, they offered a course on understanding psychedelics. So me and a, a, a colleague, we, we took this course and it was just general introduction to psychedelics. It was really good. You know, just like get, understanding Stan Groff and just some of the pioneers in the field and the history of psychedelics in North America. So just a good overview that, you know, what's dangerous, what's safe, how to do it. And just very, very good learning. And so I took this course um, that, that kind of grounded me a little bit in, into some of the, into some of the research and, you know, kind of call it just a course on psychedelics. And then they, they were doing this beta course right afterwards for therapists. This is the first one they'd ever done. And so I applied, was accepted into that. So that was, you know, the first kind of actual 
core training me a little bit. And so that one of the, one of the issues that popped up right away was, can you be uh, a psychedelic therapist or a therapist for psychedelics and not have your own experience? It was like a, like a, a question that you know, people mm-hmm. would debate. And, uh, you know, generally the opinion was quite strong that right. you needed to yeah. have your own experience, but <laughs> yeah. again, I, don't, I hadn't had my own experience. And so, uh, near the end of that course, uh, I, I kind of started networking a little bit, which is really cool. I'm starting to get to know people. And there was this, uh, this therapist from, from Norway who was uh, in that group. He's a really cool guy. And he reached out to me and said, hey, look, I run a forum for underground therapists. <clears throat> and he said, we, we vetted you. It felt like, hey, I just got vetted. This sounds yeah. really cool. <laughs> and he said, uh, we'd like to invite you to be part uh, of our agreement. I felt really honored, but also felt really green. Like, oh, I don't really mm-hmm. know a lot about it. but And that was really cool. So I got part of that forum. And I got really started to get really excited about, you know, how this could work. And, um, and then uh, the Psychedelic Today guys uh, had reached out to me and they said, hey, look, we're thinking of putting a cohort together uh, for Jamaica in December. Mm-hmm. And uh, because you make it's legal, and, yep. and would you be interested in being for part of this first cohort? I would have my own experience, and then I would hold space with people like, "Hell yeah, I'm interested." But this was June, right? And that, and it was like fifteen thousand right. dollars, and I was like, oh, "I don't know." But that was <laughs> then this Nor- Norwegian guy reached out to me right at the same time and said, uh, "Hey, there's one of the guys in our in our group is Canadian, and you're always asking about." Canada, because so much, so much, so much of the stuff you read and whatnot is on is U.S. model, right? Very, right, very right. different world than Canada, as you know. And so uh, he said, "Would you like to connect with him?" I said, "Hell yeah, I'd like to connect." So I remember mm-hmm. it was a it was a warm afternoon in June, and it was a Thursday, and I had the he was in Toronto, so I had this phone call uh, set up, and I was going to learn, you know, from this psychologist who was an underground therapist, and and uh, so we, you know, I I had learned at that point always to lead with my CV a little bit because there's yeah. a lot of there's a lot of different humans in this space and I wanted to make sure that I was taken seriously. So I I, so I said, Hi, this is me and blah blah blah. I'm serious. I'm a therapist. I know what I'm doing, you know, good good ethics and stuff. And he said, Oh, that sounds great. He said, I got one question for you. This is like in the first three minutes of this conversation. Mm -hmm. I said what he says, have you had your own psychedelic experience? And I was ready for that. I said, No, no, I haven't. I said, but listen, it's not that I'm close to it, but I you know, blah blah he goes, Well let me stop you right there. He kind of took a mentor role with me. He said, let me uh. talk, stop you right there. He says, you cannot go any further in your education, Dave, until you do this. And I was like, mm. I said, yeah, okay, I, I hear you, but uh, you know, I'm trying to learn. And, yeah. But he was really firm. And the phone call ended after 10 minutes. Wow. And I was like, I was really angry at first. Like, what the mm. fuck? I mean, I was kind of mad at the universe. Just like, right. you've, you've brought Another all this. Another roadblock. Right. And, I, and quite frankly, Brett, the main thing is I don't know how to do this. I don't, I don't know how to yeah. get mushrooms. <laughs> I, I don't know anyone that could, I don't, and they scare me a little bit. I was, and I thought, ah, you mean I got to wait till, till December now? Cause right. I was, things were moving, right? I was starting to really learn. And then, uh, about a week later, uh, he called back or he emailed me back and he said, Hey, I know, a, I know a guy in Vancouver that I've reached out to and he'd be willing to take you on a trip. And I was like, Okay, now we're All talking. Right. And uh, I won't get into that story, but it's a pretty interesting story how that one kind of happened. But I ended you, up... You can uh, get into it if you want to. Well, I've got to... Uh, well, sure, I won't tell you who it is. But, but <laughs> no, no, no. Suffice to say, this guy was a connected dude in the okay. larger psychedelic world. Yeah. And, um, and I didn't know that at the time. And at first, he ghosted me. Like, I made contact, mm. but he ghosted me. I didn't know what it was. Well, he got uh, tapped on the shoulder by his... People saying, like, we don't want you doing these underground trips. Like, we, mm-hmm. you know, we, we need you to be a little more above board than that. And mm-hmm. that, but then he went back to him and said, well, this guy's a therapist. He seems like a good guy. So I got special permission by, right. to, to go through it. I didn't, I mean, I only found that out afterwards. So anyways, I met with him. And we met at a coffee shop in Vancouver. He's a hippie, really cool mm-hmm. guy. And, uh, and he just said, uh, he got my history. He said, yeah, I'll work with you. And he said, what, uh, what are your intentions? It's like, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> right. I, I'm trying to learn psychedelics. I don't know. It's a tough question the first time so, you get it, right? So he asked, he said, well, here's what I want you to do. He says, if you could ask God, and he said, God, he said, if you could ask God four questions, what would they be? Mm-hmm. And he said, I want you to go away and I want you to think about that. And that was a good question, you know, and, and now happily or luckily I have a spirituality. So that wasn't like a strange kind of thing for me. Right. And so I put these things together and then on a warm afternoon in, uh, in August, uh, 
I met at his place and uh, he had a couple of these two little therapy dogs that oh, nice. were so cool. I was like, it was a hippie pad all the way. Yeah, yeah. Down off commercial there. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, he, he, did a, he did a smudging ceremony, which was crazy. I'd uh-huh. never, not crazy, but just novel. Different. No, yeah, yeah, different. <laughs> like, okay, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. And, uh, and then uh, he ground the mushroom up for me. It was seven grams. Now, I knew at that yeah. time that five grams was like the therapeutic dose. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, okay, seven. All right, if you if you think so. Right. And he says, well, go big or go home. That was kind of his his mantra there. So uh, he mixed it up with honey and did a beautiful little ceremony. Really beautiful. I was I was mm-hmm. really moved. Mm-hmm. And um, and he you know gave me this this I ate the seven grams of mushrooms. And then after a few minutes, I started to you know be ready. And he he laid me down and he put the headphones on. And he put the shades on. And as soon as I laid down. Uh, I started to feel very, very anxious mm. and like, oh, no, fuck, I've made a mistake. This, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't think I want to do that. And as soon as I was feeling this, this kind of anxious energy, I felt movement on the bed. It was like, or this futon I was laying on. And one of the little dogs jumped up on the, <laughs> on the futon and kind of wandered over and laid down on my legs and fell asleep. Oh, just as, but this, yeah, it was amazing. And, yeah. and I just thought to myself, uh, you know, if this little dog cares enough, about mm-hmm. me to look after me like that. And I thought of my guide, and he's a wonderful guy, beautiful guy. And I, th- and I, I thought of my wife who was at the Vancouver Library at that time, praying for me, holding me in her heart and love. And I thought, everything I've learned about this this medicine is good. So I said, oh, fuck it, I surrender. And, <laughs> oh, and, I love and, that. Yeah, and that was the start of a, you know my journey, which was life-changing for me. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely life-changing. But I, I, I said, I don't know if you, you in the story you read but Uh i think i told the reporter that when it was over i'm never doing that again i'm never doing that again it was not because it was bad it wasn't even it wasn't even necessarily a a bad or a challenging trip it just was really intense yeah it just was like i remember at one point yeah, uh, I said I said to God, "Hey, I'm an old man here. Like, dude, like, I, this, go like, easy on me." It kind of like it was a lot of intensity, <laughs> but a lot of emotion, a lot yeah. of big waves of stuff. But uh, but it, yeah, it was life life changing. So that and, and then from there, I then started moving into using it. Yeah, right. So, um, but that's is that the only time when you said I'm never doing it again? Did you stick to that? No, I've I've done I've done uh, <laughs> two other trips, two big trips. Since. All right, all right, yeah, yeah, right. No, I mean, there's, just the initial reaction. You know, it's kind of like a, I mean, I, I know you're going to get our listeners to get a lot of flack on this one because I've never had a baby, but uh, <laughs> you know, I remember when my kids were born, my wife just says, well, "I'm never doing that again." Right, and of course she yeah. did. So I, you know, whether it be amnesia or you just kind of forget. Uh, how challenging, but I, that first trip, you know, your first trip is always kind of special and, and that one, it had kind of a quality that, that my subsequent trips, which have been amazing, just Mm -hmm. weren't quite the same, quite a little bit different. Yeah. 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 That, uh, the virgin experience, right? Yeah, I guess. When it's all just, just new, kind of like anything. Kind of like anything. Yeah. Yeah. And you even said, I think right before that, that was the most powerful experience ever. It was, it was, I mean, uh, it you know I could tell just the stories that happened in it, but the the one that 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 I tell people because it was just so powerful. Uh, I, I don't remember a lot of the trip. I don't really only remember the parts that I told as stories. But uh, early on, maybe after it started, after you kind of get through the turbulence, and now you know the the medicine is really taking you places now, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, all of a sudden, I was. It was very real, Brett, like a, like like a visual, experiential reality. I was in my father's bedroom uh, just before he died. Now, my dad died from cancer when I was 14 at home, mm-hmm. but we weren't allowed into his bedroom. So I didn't see my dad the last three weeks of his life. But all of a sudden, mm-hmm. I'm actually in his bedroom. I could see the bed he was in. And what really just was so powerful, I could feel the suffering, the emotional suffering he was in because and like, like he's living with all the regrets. He was alcoholic. I've come to really love and value my dad dearly, but you know, he, he, he had some things he had to deal with probably. So, and I was feeling it, you know, the deep regrets. And yet I didn't feel that. And so I just went right to him and I said, I called him Papa. I never called him Papa in real when he's my dad. I, just, I, I said, no, Papa, I'm, I've forgiven all of that. That's, I don't even think about that. They said, look at the man I am today. That's because of you. You put these 
these ethics of, of right and wrong and, and, ne- and, and racial justice and, and treating people fairly. And that, that you gave that to me, dad. Mm-hmm. And I, and I just put my arms around that. And I just wept. And it was this, this 10 minute experience, this moving experience uh-huh. with my father. And when it was, it all of a sudden, just when the song ended, it kind of ended and dissipated. Right. And I, I took my shades off and I said to my guide, I just had the most unbelievable experience with my father. And he said, he said, yeah, I know your dad was here. And I said, I said, okay, crazy man, I'll deal with you later. But he did. He told me later on. Again, he's a very spiritual guy. Yeah, and he yeah. said he, he was. He said I didn't know what it was, but all of a sudden I felt a presence in the room that I knew instantly was your father. And he said to me, Dave, you healed your dad. And again, now that stuff that I can only say that had that was a story that happened to me. I don't know what happened in real time, right? That's a mystery right. to me. But that is that was my reality. So you have a number of those kinds of experiences uh-huh. in six hours, you know. And uh, but uh, one of the things that that was very real for me going into my trip was a fear of death. Mm-hmm. And um, that after my son died, it, it became a very real thing for me um, right. that I battled with through years. And when that experience was over, I mean, it was gone, Matt. I mean, really? not just not just the fear was gone, but an openness and embracing life and and just this an optimism about about whatever's next is next. And right. and I don't need to understand it, but I can live fully today. It'll happen when it happens, and I don't need to be afraid of it. I can be open and welcoming to it. And that has stuck as anything's become stronger and more robust. And that, like, I wasn't <laughs> expecting that, right? Yeah, and so, yeah. So to, to feel that kind of shift inside, to, mm-hmm. that, that was really an outcome, uh, mm-hmm. you know, really, because it didn't necessarily come up that way in the trip. That, that got my attention. Right. Yeah. Well, how could it not? Right, right. <laughs> uh, so releasing when your son passed, uh, when did that happen? So my son, uh, my youngest son, Sean, died in uh, 2007. He was a senior in high school, and uh, he was just on his way to a doctor's appointment one morning, and a truck crossed the center line Jeez. in Abbotsford, and he was killed instantly. Yeah, it was a, it was a tough, tough go. I mean, for my wife, is more than so than me. It's a, it's her. She's a mom and a son, and yeah. uh, but I mean, we've we've grieved well. We do really, really well. I mean, uh, the, my life isn't just about psychedelics. I have a beautiful community of family yeah, and yeah. friends in my life who walked with us, and you know, and I just, I mean, I. But I will tell you this: near the end of the trip, so the last hour of of these kind of trips, you're starting to, you're not quite as psychedelic as you were. It's a, mm-hmm. You're still trippy, but not quite the same intensity. Yeah. And it was nearing the end, and all of a sudden, Sean, he, it, he, he was just there. And it was a different quality and, and, uh, of anything else that happened my trip. It wasn't as psychedelic. It was almost like I'm looking at you. Yeah. And, and he said to me, he said, I was allowed to do a pop-in. That was his words. I was allowed to do a pop-in on your trip. And, <laughs> and so he's, he's just like, he's just there. And I just, I just, I threw my arms around him and I said, oh, Sean, it's so good to see you. And I, I said, we've missed you. We're doing fine. You know, we're doing uh, great, but oh, fuck, man. It was so awful that you had to die. So we're released really young. I missed you. And I'm, I'm just holding him, telling him what a great son he was. And I was just stroking his head like this. Yeah. And then, and then I realized as I, as the kind of, it ended that I was stroking my own head, huh. right? It was visceral. I could Whoa. feel that. Yeah. But that's, so, you know, to have a reconnection to Sean like that was, uh, was, was really special to me. I, you know, I, I, it's almost like I, I don't, I didn't really ask the trip for that. I was really content to, you know, let that be what it is. And yet this kind of transpersonal experience happened. And, you know, when I told my wife about it, uh, I know that was uh, it's when she went to her experience that she mm. her her psychedelic experience. That was one of the things that she was hoping for, and it didn't happen for her. Mm. And I know that was that was a, a bit of a disappointment at that point. Although, dude, if you're interested in a story that'll blow you away, I'll, with with my patient Lori, the cancer patient, what happened there? But Absolutely. but but that and and I have actually found that that I I need to be careful, especially with clients and patients, the stories I tell, because I don't, I don't want to build expectation into their experience. Every trip, and you know this, man, Mm -hmm, every mm -hmm. trip is unique to the person and unique to the, that point in time they're taking the, 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 having the experience. So I got, I got to be real careful not to like, Hey, you can expect these sorts of things. What happened to me? You know, it's real for me. I don't soft pedal it, but, but people's trips are so unique to them. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's like trying to uh, control your dream that you're going to have that night, right? Like, right. we have no idea. I don't know what I'm going to dream about tonight. Yeah, but but I had this conversation with my wife, right? And that right. that became something that when it didn't happen for her, mm. you know, was a real disappointment. Sense, sense, yeah, a real disappointment for her. For yeah, sure. 
Yeah, I understand that too, uh, having those expectations, but that's the, that's the factor with uh, psychedelic therapy where you have to relinquish all control. And what you said going in that beautiful part of just like, fuck it, I surrender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? What, what will come will come. Yeah. That's yeah. the place. Uh, that's the place to be in. Yeah. yeah. So that's how I got into it. Anyways, that's, the, that's a good story, man. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, and, and like, yeah, just to hear that, that reconnection to your son, losing someone very quickly like that, where yeah. you didn't get a chance to say goodbye. Right. But right, then, yeah. like you said, a visceral experience of yeah. being there and like touching him, yeah. even though you were touching yourself, like yeah. the reality was what it was, right? Yeah. Like it was it real that to you too. in that yeah. moment. Yeah. 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 Uh, which just questions everything about reality, right? right? I guess. If, it, if yeah. it felt real to you in the moment, then yeah, it's real. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's how I and see that's, it. And it's what you needed at that time. So it's it's amazing that we can we can step into these altered states and and get that kind of closure yeah. uh, and, and therapy with with these events in such a short period of time. Yeah, the, my trip was and has been all my I've done different kind of medicines like the psychedelic medicines. I, I think you know I'm certified in ketamine, so I've done that. But okay. uh, but not everyone's trips are transpersonal like that. I mean, a lot mm -hmm. are, and some are like deeply, deeper spiritual, but that's you know, many people that just kind of their life here and now and doesn't kind of get into these other things. Oh, I lost you. Uh-oh. There you are. Oh, we're back. <laughs> just a quick drop off there. Yeah. Um, so you just mentioned spirituality. You, uh, you mentioned you were involved with the church uh, yeah, earlier yeah. in life. Yeah. Christian. Well, well, I didn't, I wasn't raised that way. Right. Mm -hmm. I, my, my mom, uh, I, or she just she was she believed in God like just call yeah. it that she believed in God and so I always believed in God yeah. uh, and if and if you know if people you know kind of in my culture call God Jesus I was cool with that he seemed like right. a good guy I was <laughs> but I never went to church or anything mm. like that but uh, my family fell apart after Dad died and mm. so I was living on my own at sixteen yeah. and and you know at the time it was pretty cool but it, kind of looking back. It wasn't so cool. Like I was really, really uh, needing family. And so when I was uh, just after I graduated from high school, I kind of uh, my brother had went to this Bible college. So he invited me to go. And, you know, as I reflect on it, sure, there were parts of it that were a little, uh, you know, I needed to let go. They weren't useful to my life. They really gave me a nice structure. And so, but it was in that that I kind of got into the church. And so right. I was, you know, I got it. I went to Bible school. I graduated and I was going to be a, like a pastor, youth pastor. And so I kind of did that for a while. But again, it, uh, I, I had to eventually kind of deal with my own trauma coming up. But it also just wasn't like I, the, at that time, Christianity, I still consider myself, you know, a Christian, but it's very open Christianity. Right. It's like how I understand God. It's not the only way to understand God. But, um, but I found uh, elements of, of evangelical Christianity, it's just my story, uh, mm. just not fitting my values of life. I'm, the, the first big pillar to fall when I went to get my graduate degree was was this doctrine of hell. And I just, I said, you guys, it's just so stupid. That, Dude, that can't, can't have that. You can't have that big fear going thing. And it was big fear. So I dropped that. But once, once that dropped, then other things started mm. to drop. And then when too many things dropped, then you can't really be in the club anymore. So, it, <laughs> right. and I don't mean that in a kind of a putting down way. Listen, when I became a, a therapist, there was a church in Abbotsford that was putting hundreds of thousands of dollars each year to support my charity, to support mm -hmm. my nonprofit counseling center, because Canadians at that point didn't have coverage for, for counseling. Right. So, so, I mean, I have a lot of good to say, you know, about, you know, when the church becomes socially active and yeah. when they use their organizational power in that way. But for me personally, uh, I had to drop that, but I've always just had a very strong belief in something beyond me and mm. that that something is very, very good and yeah. very, very personal. And I'm yeah. known by that something. So, yeah. And did, did psychedelics shift your relationship to your spirituality? Oh man. So, uh, <laughs> I, in my very, very first experience, um, all of a sudden, you, you ever seen those videos where you kind of see a uh, like an embryo or a fetus in a womb uh -huh. and you can see it's kind of veiny and whatnot so i, mm -hmm. I kind of all of a sudden it was kind of cosmic and i saw this it was me i knew it was me in my mom's womb mm -hmm. and and i was simultaneously kind of watching it and looking out and so i was mm -hmm. in kind of this sack and it was kind of weird and and all of a sudden this presence that's the only word i can use but this beautiful presence just came right up to the to me was looking at me and said to me i've known you from the day you became alive and i love you and i'm always with you and it was just i was just like what the fuck i mean it was <laughs> it, this is not something you can read in a book 
right. hey, God loves you, which is a nice idea and whatnot. Mm. I was experiencing, just like you and I talking right mm-hmm. now, like there's a there's an energy right next to me who clearly has knowledge and wisdom and and it was so power so full of love and it just mm. and it dissipated that, that that little bit i think lasted like 30 seconds it was right. but it but it you know yeah i came to not there was nothing new in my view of god in like in terms of like loving personal real wise right. but, although i will say the there was a one of the things that really shifted uh, was there was such a a divine feminine feel to my mm. to my psychedelic trip and that that mm. uh, that has been uh, I mean I've always considered myself a feminist I went to a feminist school my mm. mom was a feminist so I mean I, I I believe in feminism and 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 but my experience has always been with a masculine God not, right. when I say my experience my my like my religious experience and and just the way people talk about God was always mm-hmm. like God is a father or, you know right. a masculine energy and not to disparage that this my trip was mostly about a feminine energy and right. just a divine feminine and it was pretty crazy it was good and it, it's <laughs> that that bread has deepened and broadened especially as I've you know come to understand my wife as a mother and a grandmother and I you know now I just I teach graduate school so uh, I teach a course on um, on family life cycle development I'm oh, I'm okay. now like an attachment theory and I'm I'm getting very outspoken in that space to say as we think about young families what are the tasks for young families I think the most important uh, dynamic is we have to protect the mother child attachment and that the role of the husband father partner guy if it's a man whatever is is to protect that as much as possible mm-hmm. to and and that was be, is becoming very clear to me in trying to coach couples and coach families because when if you can in a period of what one two three years really help that that relationship uh, establish itself after that they uh, that child now has got resilience Right. has got this inner strength that they can deal with whatever cards are dealt with them through their life. Now, I know that's kind of generic one up, but I believe that. Yeah. I think uh, Gabor Mate talks about that a lot too right Sure. Now. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. not the only one saying this. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, I just, yeah, that, yeah. Just, that just reminded me of, um, I believe, in the wisdom of trauma that he was talking about that. In, uh, yeah, in the, in the documentary. Yeah. Yeah. How, yeah, how yeah. dangerous it, it is to have this idea of just to like let your, your baby cry itself out. Right. right. And like right. the mother needs to be there to connect like right. and that like tra- even those traumatic moments, the downline ramifications of that when you turn into an adolescent, teenager, adult and you were neglected from that connection to your mother at that very yeah. young age. Yeah. That can be like the, the start of some very, very deep traumatic uh, issues that can lead to. Well, I would say the trauma informed and... model we're looking at probably in my judgment, 70 percent of all adults in our society have attachment issues that are showing themselves up in mood, in addictions, Mm -hmm. in troubled relationships, problems in jobs. And it it really does come down to, you know, and again, I'm not a mother blamer. I'm absolutely not. But we, we, we have to say when, when that attachment, which is just a natural flow of, you know, biology is going to happen. But when it gets interrupted by, by, you know, just uh, trauma or, you know, just too much stress or, you know, whatever, then, then we are hurting these, these children. And, and it's so easy for us to kind of look at, look at the mother and like hold her accountable. But I don't, I say, mm-hmm. I look at the people around that mother yeah, and society. say, how are you not supporting that human to do the most important thing in the universe, which is if you attach that child, like everything is going to go. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's <laughs> the thing that makes it all work is that little, that little interaction wow. right there for a short period of time. So I, I don't lay it all on the feet of moms, but, uh, but it's Gabor is right. And you know, that, that, that helps us understand addictions. It helps us understand, mm-hmm. you know, so much of these really big issues we're facing, not only on a societal level, but on a therapeutic level. Yeah. I uh, couldn't agree with you more. Um, so you did kind of, you're like, you're sketchy, <laughs> I call it sketchy, but your <laughs> your underground session, your first intro to your virgin session with yeah. uh, with mushrooms, and yeah. then did a couple of different ones. Uh, how did how did it come about for you to go through the process? Because I know you have the Section Fifty Six exemption, right? right. So, so I mean, I I had to start underground because that's yeah, you know that's I didn't what have was to. available. What, what the hell am I talking? I didn't have to, but I chose to. I remember <laughs> right. thinking about it with the, my with my wife, and 
I thought, okay, you know, a little bit of civil disobedience here is, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm really hurting anybody. Nope. And I'm, I'm a very ethical guy and very yep. safe, and I'm not going to be putting people into danger. But they're, I need to learn this. So, I, like yeah. I said, I started with friendlies, and then, then I started to move into the clinical. So, I, you know, uh, I, started, I did a couple years of work in that space. Uh, and then started to even use uh, some MDMA as well and ketamine. I got, like I think I told you, got certified. But then yeah. uh, in 20, uh, 2020, I think it was, uh, Theracil approached me. So yes. they got my name through a, through a psych nurse that I knew. And uh, I had, at that time, I had a patient who was with cancer. And, mm. and uh, they said, look, um, would you be willing to, to come onto our team and that you and your patient could make application to Health Canada? It was brand new to me. And, yeah. uh, and so we did that. We were all ready to do it, and then COVID hit. So it took a while longer. But in June of 2020, I think, is when uh, we kind of came back to it. And uh, so uh, Lori and I put our applications in, along with Thomas uh, right. uh, and uh, Bruce. And uh, we made application. And in the early August of 2020 is when we got our exemptions, which was, was pretty cool. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. yeah. So Change, were, changed were, everything, right? In terms yeah. of the legal process and whatnot. Yeah. The original pioneers. So how... How how was that conversation between the the group of you guys and so two patients and then yourself and Bruce? Yeah. Were like yeah. the original Yeah, four. we were I think there was another there may have been a third, I can't remember, but yeah, we were the first kind of applicants for this yeah. kind of section fifty six exemption. And you know, kudos to Theracil and to Bruce, you know, Tobin, because they'd been working for years, you mm -hmm. know, working with Health Canada trying to get them to be open to this and to consider this and you know, a lot of a lot of time and energy we were uh, Lori and I were kind of kind of latecomers to that party like I say only really joined the team in early 2020 but uh you know Lori is just a really great patient and you know right. as a therapist so it, yeah, I think that really helped move that along so yeah it was pretty cool when we got our exemptions do you still have your exemption or yeah I think it's, one I got expired? well I got another one then in yeah. 20 in November to use psilocybin in a training capacity yes uh, but that expires at the end of this calendar year so then so then in 2021 um i developed canada's first with therosil canada's first uh training therapeutic training program so i train therapists now um on my fourth and fifth cohort right now of training trips which is great but they're not getting exemptions to do their own work which is right. really frustrating and uh and now with the election you know we just don't really know i've i heard just recently that that it looks like uh there's been some success in the because we're we're pushing canada health canada hard for regulatory control the idea that we want to move it away from a politician making decisions about my health care to my doctor making decisions mm -hmm. so that that's the direction we want this going like I just heard this week that maybe there was some shift, but right okay. now it's a, it's a very unsettled time because the exemptions seemingly have either stopped or significantly slowed down. Like all the therapists in my cohorts now, they would qualify for the exemption, but they're not getting their exemptions. While right. a few did, most haven't. Right. And it's possible. So when you say there might be a shift, that would be within the Liberal Party, right? Uh, yeah, I, well, they're, they're currently the government. So, yeah, um, you know, next week we'll find out <laughs> what yeah. happens with that end of things. And, and you know, that, that sort of political uh, insecurity is, is not good for what we're trying to do. But, no uh, again, uh, Theracil is a great organization. You know, uh, Spencer, it, you know, he's, a, he's the CEO of Theracil. Is, is, he's tenacious. And, mm -hmm. you know, these are, all, these are all true believers over there. They are. And, and they're going to keep at it. And, yeah. you know, um, there, there may be other avenues that will emerge. Uh, really, I suppose, in a larger level, we're all in the same team. And we're saying, hey, just as long as we can get Canadians access. We've got, we have an opioid uh, crisis. We have an addiction yeah. crisis. We have a mental health crisis. And we now have medicines that are useful. But as you know, Brett, it's, just not, it's not just go out in the woods with your friends and do some mushrooms. You'll get better. Right. Maybe it's useful, but yeah. maybe it won't be useful. We're talking about psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy or MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. This, and so it needs, we need to train uh, therapists uh, because it's a very different way of doing uh, therapy, very, very different. And, and right now, like I said, by the end of this calendar year in my cohorts, 
I will have trained 80. Uh, there's the School for oh. Consciousness Medicine, they, uh, Francois Brzezat's organization. They're starting to train some. Bruce Tobin has got a cohort. But all in all, we're probably looking at 100 therapists trained in Canada by the end of this year. Well, when the when the genie comes out of the bottle on this one, when the that we you know we cross that that point when the zeitgeist is this kind of like awareness of this, there's yeah. going to be a million Canadians asking for this, oh, yeah. and and we're the bottleneck is just so obvious. We're not mm -hmm. going to have enough trained therapists even close. Yeah. So it's going to drive it underground. Probably yeah, that's, what and, was, that's what I was going to say is these, yeah. these even just these 80 people that you're training up. The only place that because they're going to have these powerful experiences, they're going to understand the medicine and the benefits yeah. of it, and going to want to work with people. Yeah. And yeah. the government, you know, our health Canada is still going to say, "No, you can't legally do this." Right? right? Are we? We right. haven't authorized this yet. So then, what's their option? They're going to do it. Right. Most people I, are going to be like, "Okay, well, I guess I'll just have some friends over to my living room, and right. this is what I have access to." Yeah, and so. uh, I don't know if you know Jamie Wheel. He's a very interesting thinker in the psychedelic space, and that sounds and, interesting. Uh, or sounds yeah, and, and and Jamie put out kind of a an open podcast to to all of us last year, and in it he he did say, "If we don't get our shit together on this one." What's going to happen is with this bottleneck I'm talking about, he said it's going to be, it's really going to go deep underground. There's going to be a lot of bad stuff happen. There's mm -hmm. going to be suicides and otherwise. And there's just like the 60s, there's going to be this massive political put exactly. And we could be further behind, you know, now that that sounds a little, you know, pessimistic, perhaps. And, and but wheel is just trying to bring our 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 attentions up say hey we really got to lobby governments lobby our MPs to say look we we're trying to do this properly so give us regulation control let us work within the medical you know framework so that so that at least there's some uh, structure around it where where Canadians can feel like they don't have to go to a dealer to find their mushrooms. They can they can yeah. come to you know an MD who will prescribe it and it's done mm -hmm. with a therapist. They can feel safe that there's you know that there's this health structure around it. And we're you know if we get this going, we can we can create that. You know yeah. it's it's not impossible. We gotta we gotta have cooperation for the government on that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, oh, what was I gonna ask there? So. Do you have a stance or an opinion on... <laughs> I got what, stances and opinions, man. I know you got stances and opinions on everything. <laughs> yeah. Just seeing what the date is today. It's the 16th, yeah. right? So we got our election in, in four days. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll know. Uh, I mean, I'm a little concerned that the conservatives might get in. Do you, do you know anything about what their position on this might be? You know, I've taught what what I know primarily is from, you know, with my colleagues at Theracil. Uh, mm. I would say perhaps generally, but none of us know, obviously. But generally, right. there'd be, you know, we had a relationship with Patty Heju and mm -hmm. the health minister. And so if if the conservative government comes in, she's out. And so we have right. to reestablish trust, reestablish this uh, with them. But on the other side of that, um, myself and Spencer and a local MD had a meeting uh, last year, two years ago with uh, with our local uh, MP. And uh, and he was great. Right, mm -hmm. uh, Ed Fast, and he's you know he's a he's a senior uh, conservative MP in Ottawa, awesome. right? and and he was probably of all the politicians I've spoken to, he was probably the most knowledgeable about this. He really? really, I could tell that he had a he had an acumen, and his own opinion was yes, we have to get this in the hands of of, of physicians. We could, we can't let Health Canada can't be like the arbiter of, of this. So so and he would and I so if he's any kind of indication of what the conservative caucus might be on this one uh that that's very encouraging but you know yeah, I, I don't really sign. i don't really know yeah well fingers crossed on that one Absolutely. fast okay that's yeah. uh yeah he's the, in abbotsford east he's the he's my MB, mp which is why we're meeting with him and awesome. uh yeah it was good yeah and so are you meeting with other mps like ndp party liberals as well i'm not just well to, spencer would be spencer i mean again I'm, yeah, I'm a right now my role is trainer right i'm training, I'm, yep. I'm training uh, therapists to to understand this model and how to do it safely and effectively but i've yeah i've, met, I've talked to other mps as well just in kind of meetings you have here and there of course of and course, yeah. and you know they tell us that uh you know psychedelics is a you know a, an issue in ottawa it's not mm. it's not like really fringy that's it's not like number one but it's 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 in the air and yeah. uh and that is good right good okay you're hearing something yeah, well, yeah work with us we're good 
yeah at least it's in the uh the, in the ecosystem there and people are talking about it yeah. so yeah, uh, I just, think that at the Canadian Psychedelic Association, I think they've got a role to play here too. So again, mm-hmm. w- one of the lovely things about the mushroom community is there's is there is this sense of like, you know, we're rowing in the same direction. Let's get our egos out of the way. Mm-hmm. Let's help each other. Let's support each other. And I do find I do feel that you know because now we got like Numinous on the block. You know, yeah. the, so they're they're a, a private company. You know, so Theracell is you know, not for profit. I just hope we can keep you know being being working well together because we have yeah. different things to do in that space. Absolutely. And there's so much work to do and everybody can kind of help each other get yeah. to where we want to go. Right. Yeah. If, yeah, if the overarching goal is just like a better uh, improved mental health state for human beings, then like we don't have a choice but to work together. Yeah. And that, that's not that, something that, that we can mine. try and monopolize. You know, and yeah, we do see that in the whole, the, like you're getting hardcore therapeutic perspectives for me, right? Because yeah. I'm a therapist, but there's this other thing going on. You know, which is really interesting. For, we would call it the indigenous stream. We might call it yeah. the shaman stream. But these medicines are are new to you, me, in North mm-hmm. America. They are not new to indigenous cultures, especially in North America with psilocybin. This is a right. medicine they understand. They understand really, really well. Mm-hmm. And I and I'm, uh, you know, we as a therapist, as like more in the medical world, we've got to go down the. If we're going to get Health Canada, you know, dancing with us, we we have got to have a medical medical language, medical uh, nomenclature around this, this model. But as a human being, as a, as a person in the psychedelic world, uh, I think we need to try to understand how indigenous lore, indigenous wisdom, indigenous shaman can come in to our world and help us understand the spiritual, uh, because this is a very spiritual experience for, for mm-hmm. most people. And we need to be able to put language around that, put, put, and, and really try to marry the two models a little bit. Right now, we, like I say, it's, it's kind of hard right now because, you know, to talk about um, smudging and ceremony and these sorts of things, Health Canada, it's just not they language. Don't which that they don't yeah, get it's yeah. not like they're bad it's just not it's no. not a construct that they're familiar with so we, yes. we we talk the way we talk now but i would say this as we look at where psychedelics are going globally or in canada this to me is like the one of the the really interesting uh kind of next steps is how how are we going to be able to find each other in these two streams because uh, again is a as a real newbie to psychedelics, like, right. Mm-hmm. I mean, six years total is right. my involvement. That's, I mean, and that's, I mean, sure. I also bring other stuff. I'm a therapist and I, I yeah. bring other skills and gifts in that, into that space. But there, like I say, we're talking about millennia of, of, uh, you know, Knowledge shaman and, and yeah, yeah, that, that, Wisdom. I mean, we would just be like, full of complete hubris to kind of pretend like we, we can't like get in behind these people and say, instruct us, teach us, we need to learn from you. And do you see a lot of that going on? I do. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's a, outside of the, you know, the Health Canada Theracell thing. It, like, right. So in the Fraser Valley, which is where I am, we, you know, we have our own uh, psychedelic association. Uh, and um, that's, I would say that that stream may be even more active than my stream. Right. And, oh, it's, wow. you know, and so I just I'm going to say Meister, I mean, like I own it, but the, the one that I'm in and yeah. it, it's it's really fascinating to me. It's a uh, there's one, you know, I, I've sat and heard stories from people that, you know, quite frankly, I just I'm I'm amazed. And I, yeah. I, I just like how how deeply therapeutic it is, except in a different, like I say, just a different structure, or a different, different ritual, yeah. a different way of thinking about it. Yeah. So what I'm what I'm kind of hearing is that the, there's still a large, large powerhouse of uh, strong community that are very much underground doing their work. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> it, when I started to kind of bump into it, you know, mm-hmm. it was kind of like, holy shit! I mean, there's so much going on yeah. that they know how to do it in a really quiet, mm-hmm. you know, just stay out of the way, but they're yeah. doing it, and I love yeah. that. I, I admire that. Yeah, no kidding. And it would be great for to for those people to feel safe to to bring that into the light and get it a little bit more into the mainstream, right. so they can create a bigger impact. Because those are where the real experts lie. Right? I think so. Yeah, the people that have been in the underground doing this for for a decades, long time, yeah, or yeah. generationally, their generationally, family's been involved. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was talking to this one one really interesting guy, uh, who's is I guess I guess we could call him a, a, a shaman and. Um, shaman, shaman, whatever, and he uh, he said that what's on his heart these days is how to reclaim some of this within his own people, 
right? He said that that there's been there that it has been lost, and of course we know in in Canada some of the atrocities that have contributed to that. But there's this there's this heart that is like hey within even the indigenous communities to to bring it back to life, to give it more prominence, to give it more space with it, and teaching and wisdom and handing down the lore that has had a tradition that's continued, but perhaps larger. That was interesting yeah. to me. Yeah, oh, right on. Um, so yeah, I just uh, I had a note down here to talk about how big the demand is. <laughs> uh, what are you seeing from the demand side of finding your, so your goal is this year you're going to get 80 people trained up. Yeah, well, we're doing that, right, yeah, yeah. How long is that list of people that are, I mean, you talk about your own experience, right, of when you tried to get in and do it before. Yeah, yeah. Is there I, a lot I of think, people interested? Are people I taking think, to it well? But people can't do much with their interest right now. I mean, that's just the reality. If they if they go to, like, the majority of these therapists saying, hey, will you take me on a trip, They're, the answer is going to be no. And they mm. won't even go to those therapists because those therapists don't have a shingle out or a website or anything that says, right. hey, I offer psychedelic therapy because it's not legal. You can't right. do that. They don't have exemptions. And so there, I think, it's, I mean, you could answer that question. Like, is there an interest in demand? <laughs> Hell yeah. Huge there is, interest but, in demand. Right. But what are you going to do with it? Yeah. Right. Like, well, who I, are you going to mean... call? Where are you going to find a person? Yeah. To help you and that? I didn't mean so much like I know the interest and demand is there from uh, personal people on a mental health level. Pretty much every single person. I mean, I might be in a bit of a bubble here, Vancouver Island. But yeah, you guys are everybody. A bit of a bubble. Yeah. Everybody I know is interested <laughs> in psychedelic therapy. Vancouver Island is hub of psychedelic medicine. Yeah, medicine. yeah. It's 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 a very fun place to to be. Um, yeah. But uh, but I meant on the. Um, so these therapists that are one, like are a lot of therapists interested in being trained up. Well, when they when they sign up for my course, okay. Yeah. So when Theracil, so Theracil does the recruiting for the course, they are given the impression. Well, I shouldn't say that. That makes it sound like they've been lied to. But their <laughs> the hope is that they will get an exemption. Right. Right. Because they don't like most therapists do not want to work underground. And I understand that yeah, yeah, yeah. they're raising families. They're in yep. like so they're not going to put their lives major at risk, you know, uh -huh. for this. So they are really counting on, you know, Theracil and other lobbying organizations to get this passed. And and we like I'll, I'm meeting with uh, my Toronto court this evening. And, you know, we are the way that my course is designed is there's this, you know, we, we meet 10 times learning the model. But then we have a retreat. Where yeah. where people prepare Experience. someone within the cohort, well, they're going to ask me. So when's our retreat? And I'm going to give them the same answer I've been given for months now. I don't know. Right. Where we, it's in the hands of Health Canada. You've uh. all made your applications. You're all waiting. I uh, I don't know what to tell you. And I and right. and so they're not going to be able to probably advertise themselves as psychedelic therapists. Although you are seeing it happening, right? Calgary's got a psychedelic oh, yeah. center now with yep. with Hearn. And yep. and uh, and you've got uh, or Harder David Harder and you've got uh, Vancouver is starting to open up little spots. Almost I don't know. Are they daring the authorities to shut them? Out? I don't know. But I'm I'm so. I'm noticing this and I got isn't this interesting mm -hmm. that that you know these organizations are just basically saying, look, we we're going to do it with or without you, you yeah. know. And uh, that that's really interesting to me. I really respect it. And maybe that's the way. Maybe people will just start doing it. Right. And, uh -huh. and it won't be really underground. Wouldn't that right. be great? However, you know, what do you do if like psilocybin is, as you know, Brett, is one of the absolute safest substances on the planet, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. relative to others. It's safer than cannabis. And yep. Cannabis is really is like really, really safe. But what are you going to do if, say, you're you're treating someone in a quasi underground way and someone mm -hmm. has like an unrelated but spontaneous heart attack and dies? Yep. Are you criminally liable now? Are you mm -hmm. civilly liable now? Mm -hmm. What's happening to your certifications? And you know that you might say, "Hey, that's pretty extreme." But I'll tell you that that hits the brains of of people in this space. Of course, of course, nobody wants to be in that situation. Of course, and it's not. unfortunate we're putting people in that situation. But and if, like, I think of my a friend of mine who's who's a, a an ER doc. Okay, mm -hmm. right. people die on him. Yeah. You no know, no fault of his own. You know, people mm -hmm. come to the ER, they're traumatized, and they they don't mm -hmm. live. Now, that's horrible, but he doesn't have to fear 
right. for that. It's just like sometimes people die. Sometimes yeah. people get hurt. In my trauma world, I'm allowed to treat trauma. I've had patients die by suicide that I have treated, mm -hmm. which is horrible and it's tragic. But I don't go to bed that night thinking that the police are going to show up my dorm because I've done it according to the, the protocols and the ethics right. of my profession. I'm protected by that. Well, this isn't protected by that yet. We, yeah. we want that when we're trying to move towards that. A 56, Section 56 exemption gives you that protection, mm -hmm. right? So you're not doing anything illegal. You followed protocols you're trained in. Someone died. We're really sorry for that. I don't, want to, mm -hmm. I don't even want to sound like I'm, I'm being insensitive, but I'm just saying on, no. on a level that you put yourself in the position of the, of the mental health professional or the health professional that, that that's just too much to ask of them. I agree. I agree. And it's, it's really like, you know, we have to manage the risk for those people, right? Right. We have to put right. a structure in place. So going back so. to your question of like, is there interest? Is there, you know, that, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. but, but there's no place to land it really right now. So, so these, these people, these 80 people that you're going to have trained up, um, are they, they can't do the experiential portion of right. the, right. Right. So you're just kind of, that's, it's a frustrating because I feel for you. It's well, yeah, a frustrating yeah, position to, to be in, man. My brain. Well, good empathy, dude. Exactly. Yeah, it's, like it's frustrating. Because you just with the woman I work for at Theracell, the, the the training director, you know, I I she just feels the same. She's like, ah. Right. You just can't quite get there. You're. It's like you know, bringing people into a course and then at seventy five percent of the way or fifty percent of the way, you're like, okay, course is over. Yeah, and they're like, "What well, do you we'll, mean?" We'll let you know when we get permission to do your thing. We'll right. get back to you. See ya. If if we do, and if we if and we, if you know, in six months or whatever, when you come back, we're gonna have to do this all over again because you'll have probably lost the, the training. Gone. Dude, you yeah. get it. That's ex you're right in my wheelhouse right now. And, yeah, and yet, and yet, they're all there. They mm -hmm. understand. Yeah, they, they get it. And yet, they're still saying we believe that that psychedelic medicines hold the promise of, of something we've never seen in, in mental health care. And we're willing to go through this uncertain time if we have to. They're the pioneers, really. And that's that's where the true power of this whole thing lies, is that there's people like yourself and all these people in these cohorts that are saying, like, I will go through this knowing that I cannot complete it right now, potentially waste my time, yeah, which and is money. precious, and money, and money yep. uh, knowing that I'm doing this because like this is something that has to move forward. Right. I think that at the end of the day, That's that powerful. is something all of us do feel. Something's mm -hmm. got to give eventually, whether it be decriminalization, legalization, regulation, something is going to give because just too many people are aware of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they're good. The, the pressure is going to continue to amount, especially as, like we said, the opiate crisis continues, post COVID uh, anxiety continues. We've got addictions, trauma. Mm -hmm. These are, mm -hmm. these are conditions that are, are getting more and more serious. Healthcare is maxed out. Right. Yeah. We know the limitations of therapy. And so that like that this is all of a sudden popped up yeah, like but you yeah, watch yeah. fantastic fungi i assume you have right oh, yeah. and and what is paul what does that documentary say the mushroom talks to us at the end saying hey we can solve your problems yeah we yeah, can exactly. solve all of your problems and at first you're like <laughs> oh isn't that sweet a mushroom i've thought about it dude and i thought man hmm. i think the mushroom is beginning to solve our problems mm -hmm. we were beginning to see each other hear each yeah. other you know, the, the Me Too movement, the cancel culture, whatever you want to look at, these are all indications that something has started. Now there's a mm -hmm. long way to go, right? Yeah. And, oh, yeah. you know, in, but I'll, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to get political in this podcast because it's not appropriate, but I will just say this. For me personally, that's all I can talk about. There was a different feel this Canada Day, right? Mm -hmm. I, we just mm -hmm. happened to be in Kamloops that day. And, you know, for us, for me to see more orange than red felt good. Now, yep. we haven't solved the problem, so I don't want anyone to pretend that we have. I think mm -hmm. there's need for great humility on the part of us white men to you know, get down on our knees and, and beg forgiveness of our right. indigenous brothers and sisters. But, mm -hmm. but uh, I think it, I, see this, I see something that feels hopeful to me, that mm -hmm. like on this sociopolitical thing that we're in in Canada, and I think, I think mushrooms have something to do with that. I do. Oh, wow. I, I, I don't think I've connected the dots on all of that, of this massive social change that's been going on and it, it, it being at the root of, of mushrooms. But uh, now that you say yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, pun. Nice pun there. <laughs> and for people that are looking to, to get involved uh, as, like, how can we help your mission and what you're doing? Well, uh, you know, the, if you're a health professional, like, get trained. 
Like we're, yeah. we, we see three, the emergence of three distinct tracks here. One's for the physicians, for the MDs, for the docs. Another for nurses. I think there's a very special space for mm -hmm. nursing care in the middle of this and then for therapists. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you're interested, you know, get educated, get trained, uh, learn, at least support it, give your money to, to organizations that are trying to change laws and whatnot in, in Canada. And yeah, that, that's what I would say on that. If you or yourself are, find yourself, you know, really, really struggling, personally and you think you know that psilocybin may be uh, something you use then then put that energy out there <laughs> you know just like some might people might call it prayer whatever but just put that say hey i need help and i mm -hmm. i have a optimism that people will find you mm -hmm. beautiful i love it yeah yeah thanks so much for spending the time with us hey, it's today, been great Dave. good to good to get to meet you Brett. so yeah you're very good sharp mind i love it uh, thanks, man. I appreciate that. Likewise. Yeah. And uh, I can't wait to see, uh, you know, how many lives you touch and change with the, with the work you're doing. Yeah, I'll have you on my podcast, hear your story. Can't wait. Cause, oh, cause man, I'd, I'd love been, to. I'm now intrigued by you. <laughs> yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll be on, uh, you know, say the word and I'll be there. Cool. Thanks, man. Awesome. <laughs>